you about Martin Luther who preached through several different books, preached through Zechariah on multiple occasions, but it wasn't until the very last time that he actually covered chapter 14. He looked at 14 and said, that's all too confusing for me. John Calvin did the same thing about Revelation. If you buy a set of John Calvin commentaries, there will be no revelation in it. This was a frightful thing. And it is frightful because there's a lot of things in here for us that are foggy, and we don't quite understand the fulfillment. But again, I repeat to you something we've been talking about the whole time we've studied Zechariah. Ours is not to know the fulfillment. Ours is not to know precisely who Gog and Magog are and all these end times details. I always think about the people in Daniel's time as Daniel was giving these prophecies. There's all this great detail. There's all this wondrous, amazing thing, but they didn't know that it was the empire of Greece that would defeat the Medo-Persians, and it was the empire of Rome that would defeat Greece, and it would uh, be Rome that split into two and parted ways and broke to pieces. They didn't know all that. They could understand the meaning. They could get the basic idea, though they could not understand in detail the fulfillment. And uh, all that to say this, I'm always wary about people who are very confident in all the ways in which every last detail could be fulfilled. And uh, sometimes they approach a passage like Uh, Zechariah chapter 14 or parts of Revelation or Daniel or other places of the Bible and approach these things with great confidence as precise fulfillment of all these things. We can go with confidence in terms of meaning, but in terms of fulfillment, uh, these things are foggy until they happen. We're not going to know precisely how all these things will be fulfilled. But we do know they will happen. We do know that God will send his son back to the earth a second time, this time not to seek and save the lost, but to judge and to save his people. This is the verse out of Zechariah chapter 14, verse 9. And the Lord will be king over all the earth. On that day, the Lord will be one and his name one. So we anticipate that day and all we join all genuine believers. Right? It doesn't matter what end times views they have if you're a genuine believer, if you look at the Bible for face value, we all believe Christ will return, and we anticipate the day of his return. There are several basic options Bible-believing Christians have had over this. I'm going to do the same thing I did last week, and, and that is to just to give you these three basic options. Um, these options, I think last week I gave you two options. These options um, are generally uh, these come out of, uh, arise out of Bible-believing Christians. So I just want to say here now that um, the people that hold these options, I didn't pull options from people who don't believe Scripture, who have various and spurious translations or interpretations of Scripture. These are people who genuinely believe the Bible. And uh, so we can affirm this. They have good reason. They're trying to understand the Bible. They have good reason for these things. Uh, so I don't want to disparage them, but I do want to show you what perspective I will generally be speaking from. One option is this, is to say chapter 14 is all about what's going to happen between their time, Zechariah's time, and the arrival of Christ. Um, I think early on you start to see maybe this sort of breaks apart, and especially as you get to the later parts of the chapter, it just seems like there is a physical reality to the reign of Christ in here. Um, So I think that option is not the greatest of options. But again, there are people looking at the Bible, analyzing the words, they understand the language, and they come up with this option that this is all, uh, the prophecy that Zechariah gives here is all fulfilled before Christ even arrives. Uh, But again, I think you you would struggle with that, especially if you look back at the way he describes Jerusalem in an international sort of worldwide way, the the church of God, especially as you look at chapter 2, chapter 12, it seems like he's not just talking about now, what's going to happen between their time and the arrival of the Messiah? Another option, this describes merely the very end of the apocalypse climax or the rebuilding of Jerusalem. Now, I'm going to give you a third option in a minute. It doesn't include that. But some translate, some interpreters would say this only is talking about the very end of time. The arrival of Christ at the very end of time. These would be uh, the sort of hardline dispensationalists. And again, I think these guys interpret it that way because they believe the Bible and they want to understand the Bible. But uh, these are the hardline dispensationalists. The the more leaky, moderate, uh, progressive dispensationalists like John MacArthur would not fit in this. 
Um, but the guys like Schofield, some of you have a Schofield study Bible. Remember that study Bible? Um, Charles Ryrie may be a name that you guys recognize. Um, they believe in very clear seven dispensations of time. And uh, they have great trouble with the progressive dispensationalists. They don't like them at all uh, because they disagree with them about things like this. But they would take this view of this chapter. This is merely about uh, the moment when Christ sets up his kingdom. The majority opinion, which is the opinion I stick with, and people in various camps, ah, mill, pre-mill, uh, would agree with these camps. And that is, this describes both the age of the church, especially as you get the first few verses of the, of the passage, the persecution of God's people, the persecution of the church. It seems like it's describing the, ch- the age of the church, but the age of the church ends with the arrival of Christ. And this is sort of the majority opinion on this passage, and it is the, major- it is the opinion from which we'll be looking at this passage. These, again, these opinions are not held by people who don't believe the Bible. They hold these opinions because they do believe the Bible and they believe they're being faithful to the Bible. So I just want to make note of that. These are not people who are trying to reject the Bible but believe the Bible. But the majority opinion is that this is a description of the church age as it comes to a close and then culminating in the arrival of Jesus Christ in the second coming. Uh, that would be different if you're a dis- dispensationalist. The second coming is distinguished uh, in dispensational theology from the rapture. This is not talking about. This is the second coming of Jesus Christ. So, what kind of description do we have here? It starts out by giving us a description of a divinely appointed persecution. Behold, a day is coming for the Lord. And this, this is language you've heard before, the day of the Lord, right? This can describe particular judgments. There were particular judgments that happened already in the Old Testament era that the way God described it through his prophets was to call it the day of the Lord. But it's also a description of that end times, that era when Christ returns and the judgment of God pours out on the earth and he saves his people and makes things right. So this is the day of the Lord. A day is coming of the Lord when the spoil will be taken from you. And divide in your midst. So the day of the Lord is not just about judgment. It begins with this persecution of God's people. This is why I believe it be, this begins with the church age. By the way, I want you to notice that it is a divinely appointed. I will gather, verse 2, the nations against Jerusalem. So this is under the sovereignty of God. This is all a part of God's plan. And I talked about it in the worship service that this is part of God's sovereign will, that his moral will be violated for an era. And here is that era represented by the persecution of God's people, all gathered in Jerusalem, God's church, people in this worldwide Jerusalem, all being a part of God's people, even maybe including the Israelites who have been grafted back in. Here is this group of God's people who are being persecuted, and it's under God's plan. This is a summary statement, verse 1. Verse 2, this is a very violent, devastating persecution. For I will gather the nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, and houses plundered, and the women raped. This is violent. This is horrifying. Did you know that we are living right now in the peak of of Christian persecution. Did you know that? I know we think of uh, the picture here. We think of Nero, and we think of uh, Christians being thrown to the animals. We think of uh, worldwide proclamations, you know, they're going out across these empires. But more Christians are being persecuted and put to death now than ever before in human history. And it's not just, you know, you believe the wrong religion, let's behead you or put you on the electric chair. It is terrible things, like rape, I, I've known of missionaries whose wives, before they died, were raped by the people who came in to kill them because they were Christians. This persecution is terrifying. It's horrible, and it's happening all over the world, even as we speak. You, you think places like Indonesia and Sri Lanka and places where people have violent hatred. Uh, Middle East, there's a violent hatred of all things Christ, of all things Christian. 
And it's happening, and it's, and it's terrible the kind of things that are perpetrated against Christians simply by virtue of them being Christians. And this persecution is happening even now. The second part of two, it says, half of the city shall go out to exile. So you have this, this scattering of people who are running away and fleeing the persecution. The rest of the people shall not be cut off from the city. So some stay, some scatter and the attackers, the people persecuting these Christians, will momentarily be victorious as God's people run away. And this picture, this painting, I love to put up paintings paintings in my mind. I, I like art. I like paintings, especially the realist, along the realist camp. But here's a realist painting of Christians being persecuted in the Roman era. And if you look at the whole painting, it's a wide painting, like 16 by 9, and it's this broad painting and this whole picture of these Christians gathered in this arena trying to protect themselves and protect one another against the vicious animals. And it's quite grotesque. You, you, you ought to be happy that I didn't include the whole painting because when I say realist, I mean it's realist and people being torn to shreds. And this is what's happened. This is a description of what's happening in our era. It's a description of the age of the church, though God's kingdom marches on, though there is victory, though there is a growth of God's kingdom, there is also a great deal of persecution. And I believe that's what these couple of verses are telling us. Well, that persecution ends at the arrival of Jesus Christ. Jesus will arrive as a king in full battle array. Look at verse 3. Then the Lord will go out and fight against those nations as when he fights on a day of battle. That language, then the Lord will go out, that is the language of a king. It's hard for us to kind of imagine, but back in the day, they didn't have uh, the, uh, the chief of the armed forces sitting back in his own armchair as he commands troops a million miles away. No, the kings used to go into battle. You think of King David going into battle, and you think of when he didn't do what he was supposed to do, right? He, he stayed back from battle and sent his warriors ahead so that he could cover up a sin, a sin with Bathsheba, right? No, kings used to be the leaders in battle, and that's the language here, that here comes the Messiah, the king, and he shows up. And this time he's not showing up riding on a foal of a donkey. This time he shows up as a king going out for battle. Well, that gives me chicken skin, right? The, the return of Christ is to come as a king to set things right. I don't know, maybe it's because I'm getting old. But more and more I'm looking back and saying, Things are getting so terrible. Things are so awful. Think about the good old days, how simple things life was and how simple things were and how much better people were and how immoral they all are now. And I look forward to the day when the king will show up and deal justice. Verse 4, he will arrive in the midst of persecution and martyrdom, but will instantly be engaged in battle against those who are persecuting his people. On that day... His feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives that lies before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall be split into two from the east to west by a very wide valley, so that one half of the mount shall be moved northward and the other half shall move, be moved southward. Now, I'm going to show you a picture of Jerusalem here in a minute. Um, but I don't, think, I don't think you have to make a decision on whether this is literal or figurative. I tend to believe this is figurative, but if you believe it's literal, I think we come up with to the same meaning. And the meaning is, is that God is, when Christ arrives, he will instantly go about rescuing his people. So whether or not Jesus stands, I don't really know, stands and actually a big crevice appears and there's the movement of mountains, I don't know. But the idea is that even as they are fleeing Jerusalem, these people who are fleeing the city of God under persecution, the way will be made flat. There will be an, an easy way to go. And I'm going to show you how that happens in the imagination. The people, as they heard this, the people in Zechariah's day, would understand the geography, or the topography of Jerusalem. And those of you who have been to Jerusalem, Rob and others have been to Jerusalem, you know this is a very hilly place. It's not easy just to, you know, flee Jerusalem. You have to go down many, many, many feet, hundreds of feet 
and there's crevices and drop-offs and cliffs and all this. And the idea is that when Jesus shows up, he's making their, fle- uh, their flight from their persecutors easy. He's instantly bringing justice. He's instantly rec- uh, uh, rescuing them. He's instantly doing something about this persecution problem. He's setting things right. Verse 5 indicates... And you shall flee to the valley of my mountains. The valley of mountains shall reach to Azal. Again, this idea of this, this, this flight being made easy. As you fled from the earthquake of the days of Uzziah, the king Judah, it's just reminding them something happened not too far back in their own memories, which would have been a great earthquake as people fled the city. So there's this idea of people fleeing, and he's going to make it flat. It's not going to be hard. It's going to be like the people fleeing Jerusalem the day of U- Uzziah, but it'll also be easy because they'll be able to run away freely. There's an ease to it that, that Christ himself shows up and brings. The Lord my God will come and all the holy ones with him. So he will arrive with millions of his holy worshipers. You can interpret that holy ones as angels or perhaps people who have died, the, the people who are believers who have died that he brings back. Either way, we understand that Christ is going to arrive with an army. He's not going to arrive alone, though he could defeat all the enemy forces alone. He arrives with this great, massive army. So here's the picture of Jerusalem. Looking there is, you can see the Temple Mount upon which the Dome of the Rock. So let me just uh, see if this works here, see if you can see this or not. Um, It probably won't work that great because it's all over wireless and the file's actually up there. So... um, This right here, if you follow this across like this, this is what's called the Temple Mount. And you'll notice the wall goes on of Jerusalem, goes on and goes on over here. But this is the Temple Mount. This is about a 40-acre flat area that King Herod built up, right? The Jewish temple used to sit about right here, kind of right next to where the Dome of the Rock is. Uh, Before the Muslims came in, there's a lot of mosques up here, The, the biggest and most popular is actually this one, not the Dome of the Rock. Alaska is the most popular one. You guys probably walked into it. Uh, They let you up there, and you can go look at it and walk into it and see what it looks like. Um, Sometimes they don't let you. One time they, I've been allowed on there, but I've was not every time uh, into the Dome of the Rock. But the Jewish temple would sit right here. This is what, there would have been a a palisade, columns all around the edge of this, and this is where Jesus was. In fact, uh, this is what it looked like in Jesus' day. In fact, What some scholars believe, if you remember back to the temptation of Christ, and it says that the devil took Jesus up to the pinnacle of the temple, a lot of scholars believe that doesn't mean, you know, at the top of the temple building way up here. A lot of people believe that he took them to this edge because this edge is several hundred feet down. And, of course, they didn't have this nice road right here in Jesus' day. This was just been a cliff several hundred feet down. And some people believe that's exactly where the devil took Satan, right right to this spot to look down and say, throw yourself down, the angels will, will snatch you up. So, what I want you to get into your mind is that this is a steep decline. You can tell by all this terracing that happens here. This is hundreds of feet. This is a very deep crevice, the Valley of Kidron. Over here, the Valley, valley of Hinnom, where they burnt the children. It's where we get the word Gehenna from. But this is the Valley of Kidron, and you're standing here on the Mount of Olives overlooking all these tombs. Uh, Rob, it's probably a picture. This picture probably came from the seven arches. Anybody else been to Israel? I actually stayed in, uh, in yeah, uh, Chuck's been there. Uh, this, these, these, uh, this, there's a hotel right on top of the Mount of Olives with seven actual arches. You can see it. And it's actually higher than uh, Jerusalem. The idea is that Jesus is going to stand on the Mount of Olives and all of this will be made flat. In fact, a big crevice will go right through this area so the people fleeing Jerusalem won't have to climb up this other hill, uh, the Mount of Olives. They can just flee out very easily. And that's the idea. That's the, the intent of this passage, that the moment that Christ arrives on this earth, there is going to be relief of persecution. There is going to be a, a, a battle that he instantly begins a war that he begins against the enemies of him and all his people. And he will begin the great rescue, physical rescue of his people at that point. 
So that gives you a physical idea. When he's talking about this, they would have understood a split in the Mount of Olives. They would have understood what he was saying about their fleeing being easy. and what, They would have understood what Christ was doing, what this king was doing when he arrived. He was making their flight easy so that he could punish the, uh, the persecutors. What happens in this arrival of the Messiah? Well, very simply, the curse is reversed, and I believe that's what it's saying. Beginning in verse 6 and going all, down, all the way down to verse 11, it says there in verse 6, On that day there shall be no light, cold, or frost. These are things that have been the natural evils of the world for all of human history from the moment of the curse onward. Night, darkness, cold, exposure, deserts, famine. These are things that are the result of God's curse on not just people, but this earth. This earth is floating on a bed of lava. And every once in a while, earthquakes... Some even want some, sometimes the lava actually spurts out and people are killed. There are massive things that happen. This is part of this curse. This earth is messed up. And what we see here is Jesus beginning to reverse this curse. The, the no night, and, the, and it kind of reminds you of what's going to happen in heaven where there's no night and the presence of God is everywhere. That's sort of mimicked here on earth. We're not afraid of the dark anymore. This is a, this is a source of of fear, right, for all of us, from a very young child. I remember a number of years ago, but we just had our 20th anniversary, 20 years ago, I suppose, I remember that feeling, and some of you men can recall this, that feeling, that first idea, the first few nights at home alone, you kind of think, wait, it's not just me in the barracks or by myself, I have to take, I have to worry about someone else here. And you go around and you lock the house and you turn lights on and turn certain lights off and you go around and you secure the place. Even if you don't have this sort of existential fear of the dark anymore, we all secure our place. We don't live in Mayberry. We lock the doors at night. And, and this king arrives, God himself arrives, and he's starting to undo this curse. He's reversing the whole status of the world. We cannot worry and not be afraid anymore. He has brought light to the world. So, danger and exposure of night. The earth no longer is plagued by drought, desert, and famine. Verse 8, on that day, living waters shall flow from Jerusalem, half of them to the eastern sea, half of them to the western sea. Again, you could take this literal or you can take this figurative. I tend to take this one figurative, especially because there are other descriptions of this very instance, and the waters are flowing in different directions. I think what it is saying is the same thing, is that when Christ comes, he is setting right this desert famine place of Jerusalem. Jerusalem had always lived on borrowed or welled water. They had to draw water up with great work out of the ground. They had to get water from somewhere else. It's a dry area. If you have been to Israel, you know it's very dry. It's like these mountains right here. Unless there's rain, it's just dry and crusty and brown and ugly. I remember thinking that about Jerusalem. when I, The very first time I went there, I think I was like seven or eight years old, thinking how dry and filthy and nasty and dirt just sort of in the air, and just didn't seem like a great place. But that will end. Christ will come, and all of this worry about water and food and provision, and all of that will be taken care of by Jesus Christ. He will arrive, and he will settle all these things. Drought and famine and exposure and night, these things are going to be over when Christ arrives. He will arrive, and he will reside and take authority in his palace in Jerusalem. Again, I tend to take this a little more figuratively, but if you take it literally, you come to the same conclusion. The idea is that this is the lifted up place. This is the place where the king resides and everybody knows it. Verse 9, the Lord will be king over all the earth. That's the verse I read. And on that day will be one his name one. Everybody will know. And then verse 10, the whole land shall be turned into a plain from Geba to Rimon 
south of Jerusalem. But Jerusalem shall remain aloft on its site from the gate of Benjamin to the, pal- to the place, the former gate, to the corner of the gate, the tower of Hanel to the king's winepress. And it shall be inhabited, for there shall never again be a decree of utter destruction. Jerusalem shall dwell in security. In other words, this persecution of o- is over. All these people who had fled are coming back. And they're all joining together again. And they know where their king resides. And he, they know who he is. He is the king of the earth. As he launches his reign, everyone will understand. And this will be lifted up. Everyone will understand who their king is. It continues to describe this, verses 12 through 15. Now turns to the negative side of his arrival. And that is, he's come to judge. The arrival of Christ for the enemies of Christ is not a day of joy. Christ is arriving as a thief in the night. We expect the arrival of Christ. We long for the arrival of Christ. We beg for the arrival of Christ. We may not know the day and the time and the hour. That's not Christians, but we do expect it. And so when Christ arrives and all of this begins to happen, we rejoice and we praise. But all the people who've rejected Christ are shocked and amazed and terrified. This is a day of judgment for them. How is this described? This shall be the, uh, and this shall be the plague with which the Lord will strike the peoples that wage war against Jerusalem. Their flesh will rot While they're still standing on their feet, their eyes will rot in their sockets and their tongues will rot in their mouths. He brings about a plague upon all those who resist. He brings about a panic on that day. A great panic from the Lord shall fall on them. You get this idea there's this this war and they're trying to fight against him, but Everybody's joining together in terms of the people of God and all the holy ones and God himself, Christ himself, are warring against them. So they're all joining together, but they're being defeated. There's panic. They seize the hand of another, and the hand will be raised against the hand of the other. Even Judah will fight at Jerusalem. I think that's what that's saying is that all the people of God will fight alongside with one another. And these people who resisted Christ, who resist the Messiah... They will no longer be victorious. They will no longer be able to persecute and plunder and kill and rape the wives of the believers. No, it is we who will be victorious. Judah will fight at Jerusalem, and the wealth of all the surrounding nations shall be collected, gold, silver, garments, in great abundance. See, the plunder is happening in the opposite direction. Verse 15, in a plague like this, shall fall on the horses and the mules, the camels, the donkeys, and whatever beasts may be in those camps. In other words, there is this curse, this plague that goes out from all of those who reject and resist, even the animals. But he turns again to the positive side and gives us hope. I'm just going to pause right here and say this. There's a number of ways that God, through Scripture, Uh, encourages hope and gets us happy and joyful even in the midst of persecution and difficulty and hardship and sin. One way, and there's multiple ways, but, but one way is that he tells us to look back at what God has done, to look at all the things. If you read the book of Psalms, so much of it is looking back at what God has done. Oftentimes, in spite of our own folly and our own sin, God continues to be gracious. We ought to look back at what God has done. The Bible also encourages us, especially when you think of Romans 5, 6, 7, and 8, the, the fact or the joys of what God is doing right now, what He's doing in us and for us, interceding for us, working through us, inspiring us, helping us obey, giving us strength. Never letting his love fall away from us. These are great joys. So that's another way we find joy in the midst of tribulation. But another way we look, we find joy in the midst of tribulation is to look forward. And that's what Zechariah is doing here. He's calling us to look forward. He speaks of the persecution and hardship right at the beginning. 
But then it's sort of this, this plotting, this, this great uh, joyful look of what's going to happen. And this is where the book of Zechariah ends, the joy of the coming of Christ. Verses 16 to 21 is how he cleanses the world and he causes every part of the world to be in worship of him. Verse 16, Then everyone who survives all the, of all the nations that have come against Jerusalem shall go up year after year to worship the King, of, King, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Booths. I had to kind of scratch my head on that one. Why would he bring up the Feast of Booths? What I discovered is that in the Hebrew mentality, and even if you look at some of the passages of the different feasts, what you find out is the Feast of Booths is sort of the, the cumulative feast. It's the feast to sort of look at all the feasts and look at all that God has done and to rejoice. If you remember, this came up, of course, when Jesus was on the Mount of Transfiguration and Peter said, should we build a booth? Is this the ultimate feast of booze? And we look at all these feasts as pointing to this one moment, and we're going to rejoice. Well, what Zechariah is saying is, once Christ arrives, the eternal feast of booths begins. All that God has done and is doing will be celebrated in perpetuity forever. This joyous feast has now begun. Isn't that great? The feast of booze, the real feast of booze, not just the shadow, the real feast now begins at Christ's arrival. As this happens, there will indeed be separation. And the families of earth don't go up to Jerusalem and worship the king. If people don't enter the city and leave their city, going back to chapter 2, right, this figurative idea of people abandoning the world and following Christ and joining, becoming citizens of this great immeasurable city that grows over the whole world, the city of Jerusalem, with God as their king, the Messiah on the throne. If they resist that, God will not give them rain. He will not give them blessing. He, they will continue to live in this desolation and this plague any of the families, if the family of Egypt, verse 18, doesn't go up, there shall be no rain, there shall be a plague. They need to go up, repent, and join this feast of booze. There shall be a punishment to the nations who don't keep this feast of booze. And what we see in the last two verses is that everything, everything, everything we do, everything we touch becomes something with which we praise God perfectly. This is all what we do. We live our lives and everything becomes an element of worship to God. So look what it says there. On that day there shall be inscribed on the bells of the horses, holy to the Lord. Stop right there. Bells on horses. I had to look this up. Bells on horses. Usually bells were put on horses, uh, not any kind of horse, but they would put them on war horses. And it was kind of like a war trumpet. It was to make you aware of where the cavalry was and what was happening. And you could hear what was happening so that you could rush over. As a warrior, as a soldier, you couldn't see. But you could hear the bells and so you could rush over. But these things will be turned from bells that call people to war to bells of celebration, like at Christmas time. Bells will be rung. There will be great joy. These bells on horses will be turned into an item of worship for God. Verse 21, And every pot in Jerusalem and Judah shall be holy to the Lord of hosts, so that all who sacrifice may come and take of them and boil the meat of the sacrifice in them, and there shall no longer be a traitor in the house, traitor, not traitor, right? A traitor in the house of the Lord of the host on that day. What he's saying is, he's, he's reminding us of these, you know, there were special bowls that were used in the sacrificial system that Israel lived in in the time of Zechariah. And what Zechariah is saying is, guess what? Every bowl, even the bowl you eat out of, even the bowls you have in your house, everything you touch, everything you do, all of it will be used to worship God. Everything we do. It is the longing, it is the di- desire of every genuine Christian. I said this during the worship service to be like Christ, to worship God with everything we are, our heart, mind, soul, and strength. And finally, when Christ comes and our bodies are glorified, we will finally get to do that. And everything we do will be lived in total worship of Jesus Christ. That's the day 
that's coming that Zechariah is describing for us. Isn't that great? I don't know about you, but we do tend to lose hope. I mean, this, this swinging of the pendulum, right? We have great things happening on the front of uh, abortion, right? We have some good things that are happening there. But I know something. Unless Christ returns, it's just going to swing right back, probably just more violently than it swung in that direction. They're already preparing to come back and assert abortion rights, that, to kill live babies, born live. They, many people who, who promote this idea of killing our most vulnerable, they don't have any problem of a person giving birth to a baby and killing them right there on the spot. We know that these times are terrifying and horrible and awful. We know that these things that are happening across the world, though they may swing in one way for a while, it doesn't take very long for this world to go bad again. We know that this thing, and we just pull our hair out and say, Maranatha, Lord, come quickly. And we hold on to this hope that indeed he will come. And he will set things right. And he will finally deal justice to all the evil ever. And the thing that will happen, it's something that I described in my sermon a few weeks ago, is that finally, even mentioned it this week, finally the moral will and the sovereign will of God will be one. All things will be made right. There will not be injustice. There will not be murder. There will not be rape. There will not be persecution. There will be worship of God Almighty forever. Don't you look forward to the Feast of Booths? I do. I think that's what this whole book is about. The whole book of Zechariah is, call, is calling us to be zealous, calling us to persevere, calling us to keep on going because one day our Lord will return. And he will sit on his throne, and he will winnow away all evil, and he will cause the whole earth to worship him. The day of the Lord. Let's thank God for this day, and then we'll sing and be dismissed. Father, what a great day. We anticipate this day. We look forward to that day that you will return. We look forward to the day, Jesus, when you return and you bring your recompense with you. But you also will frame creation. At the beginning, when things were perfect and things were good, you were there and you will return at the end. And you will not only restore things to Eden like perfection, you will bring about a feast of rejoicing. A kind of rejoicing that we would not without this era of sin and darkness and grief and salvation. So Lord, we get to be returned not just to the state of Eden, but a state of greater joy, greater worship, even feasting for eternity. We anticipate that day. We look forward to that day. We put our hope in Jesus Christ who will return on that day. Help us do this. In the name of Jesus, we pray.